to the time of Pythagoras, the master egghead of them all. Pythagoras? The father of mathematics and music. Mathematics and music? Ah, you'll find mathematics in the darndest places. Watch. First, we'll need a string. Stretch it good and tight, plunk it. Now divide in half, plunk again. You see? It's the same tone, one octave higher. Now divide the next section. And the next. Pythagoras discovered the octave had a ratio of two to one. With simple fractions, he got this. And from this harmony in numbers developed the musical scale of today. What Pythagoras discovered was that, rather like the way that architecture relies on perfect proportions to make a pleasing structure, musical notes also worked harmoniously together when they had a simple mathematical relationship. His discovery, according to legend, happened quite by accident. So the story goes, he was walking past a blacksmith's when he heard a harmonious chord of chimes coming from the sound of hammer on anvil. The harmony of the chimes sounded so perfect to Pythagoras that he rushed in to find out more. When he weighed the hammers that were making the sounds, he discovered that they were simple ratios of each other. One was half the size of the first, another was two-thirds the size, and so on. What Pythagoras was actually hearing was a demonstration of natural harmonics. Now, if you take a piece of metal and strike it, it makes a note. It's a simple note, but with many other notes in its overtones, or harmonics, rather in the way that light is made up of a spectrum of different colours. Just because you can't see them with the naked eye doesn't mean to say they're not there. If you listen to the metal bar's note, in the resonance of the sound, you might be able to hear various higher versions of the same note. If notes were colours, you could call this note red and its higher version light red. These higher versions are what we now call octaves, and they're all there contained within the original note, whether you like it or not. That's nature for you. Now, if you take a piece of metal exactly half the size of the original, it will produce as its main note that light red. And if you play the two together, they make a sound almost like one note. An octave, therefore, is a totally natural distance between notes. This is the same sound, only a higher version of that. But if you strike a piece of metal exactly two-thirds the size of the original, you actually create a new note, call it yellow. And believe it or not, this new note is also contained in the overtones or harmonics of the original. And that's because two-thirds is a naturally harmonious ratio in maths. It was this creation of new notes from the relationship of two-thirds that caught Pythagoras' imagination. Those overtone intervals also correspond to precise mathematical divisions of a string. Divide the string in half by pressing on it, and you get an octave, a ratio of two to one to the original note. Divide the string so that two-thirds of it vibrates, and you get the fifth, a ratio of three to two to the original tone. And if three quarters of the string vibrates, you have the fourth, a ratio of four to three to the original tone, and so on. There are features of music that appear to be universal, such as the octave. That's the ratio of two to one of the frequencies that create the notes. There's a physical acoustic reason for this. That's a case of the brain having evolved in a world with certain physical regularities, and the brain has incorporated those physical principles in its development. The neurons actually fire synchronously with the fundamental frequency of the sounds we hear. Two other musical universals in terms of intervals are the perfect fifth and the perfect fourth. 
not every musical culture has them, but they tend to be, after the octave, the most common features of musical systems or musical scales. Again, probably the way they impinge on the, the cochlea, the physiology of it, determines the way that they've spread across cultures and across time. If you've ever wondered why we have our particular set of notes to play with, well, they were chosen first by Pythagoras. And he found them by dividing pieces of metal by two-thirds. If you carry on dividing by two-thirds again and again, you create an infinite sequence or spiral of notes. Now, it's quite hard to visualize Pythagoras's endless cycle of notes, so we're going to build a spiral to show how it works, with these colored tiles representing the notes. The first note, red, is easy, because that was the note we made from our original metal bar. And that's the foundation, or the base, of our spiral. By dividing that first piece of metal by two-thirds, we were able to create a perfectly tuned new note. Call it yellow. And that goes in a bit higher up. The pitch of the sound dictates its exact position in the spiral. By dividing yellow by two-thirds, we can create a third note, higher still and further round, and so on and so forth into an infinite spiral of new notes. The mathematical distance between them makes a rather satisfying shape. With the twelfth note in position, you can see from above a pattern emerging with the notes roughly spaced around the circle of the octave. But when you get to the thirteenth note, it all goes horribly wrong, which I can show you if I collapse the model. Because the thirteenth note wants to shove the first note out of the way. This battle to occupy the same space creates a terrible and upsetting dissonance and is the result of something known as the Pythagorean comma. Pythagoras's solution was simple and ruthless, to do away with the notes of 30 and upwards altogether. But the problem of the dreaded comma was even graver than Pythagoras had imagined. It didn't just affect the 13th note, but the distance between every note in the octave. The distance between two notes is determined by tuning. To tune a note is to adjust that distance. For all the notes to work perfectly together, they would need to be tuned so they were exactly equally spaced, like the dials on a clock face. As it was, the comma shifted each note a little off-centre, producing a slightly uneven pattern, which got progressively worse with each step of the spiral. To begin with, musicians played extra safe by using only the first seven notes of the spiral, which, together with the original, made up the basic eight-note scale from which the word octave derives. Every Tom, Dick and Heinrich across Europe had his own temperament. Chaos reigned. Notes were being pulled this way and that to accommodate the different needs of different keys. The trouble was, a tuning that worked for one piece of music sounded wrong in another. Putting instruments with different tunings together in the same piece of music was increasingly problematical. By trying manfully to cope with all the extra notes composers wanted, keyboard tuners ended up with some hideously deformed and mutated note relationships. These were known as wolf tones on account of the grim and unsavoury howling of their dissonance. Lurking behind all this tempering, tuning and wolfing about lay a simple, terrifying truth waiting to be unearthed. This was the concept of an equal temperament. That is, a tuning system that divided up the octave artificially into 12 exactly equal parts. Instead of having 12 different keys with their own individual patterns of notes, like cogs belonging to different wheels that can't interlock, the idea of an equal temperament was to create a single mathematical pattern of notes. This would become the blueprint for all the keys so they could fit together in the same piece of music. The question was, how could musicians who tuned their instruments by ear create a mathematically perfect scale? For a while, it seemed an impossible dream. 
The tuning system of Bach's time, which had been devised through trial and error, could at last be implemented using mathematics. The formula for equal temperament produced a fiendishly precise figure, the twelfth root of two, which could now be applied with accuracy and ease. Keyboards and other instruments could be mass-produced with the help of machines. Pianos were given huge iron frames, allowing metal strings of incredible tension to be held taut and stable. The holes in oboes, clarinets and bassoons could be bored with minute exactness. The age of a truly equal temperament had arrived. From about the 1830s onwards, all factory-made instruments conformed to this new mathematical standard. Once the instruments were mass-produced, they could be exported all over the world. The global invasion of equal temperament had begun. Here's the Western one. Think of the notes as rungs on a ladder. This, in short, is how all musical scales or ladders work. You decide how close together you want your rungs to be, and you make each rung a note. Now, some musical systems have 24 rungs in their ladder. In Western music, we have 12. In Chinese and Indian music, there are many more rungs on the ladder, and so the notes are much closer together. So, we've got our basic notes then, but now we have to decide how high or low these notes are. The measuring of how high or low a musical note is, is called pitch. Now, if I blow down this organ pipe, I will produce a note. The note is called A. But if I blow down this other organ pipe exactly half the size, it'll also produce a note called A. This A is obviously much higher. Same note name, different pitch. The pitch of a musical note tells you how high or low it actually is. On our Western musical ladder, every twelfth rung is another A. The next element in melody is the distance between notes, between your A and your C and your E and your G, for example. These distances are called intervals. Intervals are the distances between the rungs you choose to play on your musical ladder. In Western music, the smallest interval is from one rung of the ladder to another. It's called a semitone. As you'd expect, then, a whole tone is an interval of two rungs on the musical ladder. <laughs>